sometimes when you're looking at your health and well-being, you want to look beyond the usual places. And today I'm really excited because those with toxic relationships, remember I talk about it all the time, you're likely to have your immune system suppressed, you're going to have things going on, you're going to be susceptible to other kinds of things running by. So we're going to talk today about toxic relationships and how it relates to kind of alternative things. We're going to talk about natural medicine, functional medicine, all kinds of alternative approaches with my absolutely fabulous guest. Stay tuned. Welcome to Save Your Sanity Podcast. I'm Dr. Roberta Shaler. Are you living with the chaos, confusion, and uncertainty that a toxic person loves to create? Is a partner, parent, ex, sibling, child, or co-worker causing you to second-guess yourself? That can be crazy making. I'm here to help you save your sanity. So let's get down to it and figure some things out now. Stay tuned. This is an exciting episode for me because I've been waiting to talk to Dr. Sundar Das Anomaly for ages <laughs> and we've been trying to connect and it hasn't worked. And fortunately, we both found ourselves in San Diego a week ago. So here we are quickly being able to get online and make it happen. So welcome to the program. Thank you, Dr. Robert. Uh, it's a real pleasure to be finally, finally talking to you. It is good fun. And, you know, I was sitting when we first met and a woman came up to sit with me. And then she looked behind me and she saw you and she just went into great surprise. And she turned to me and she said, do you know who he is? <laughs> do you know how famous he is and how wonderful he is and how many people turn to him to improve their health? So that was a lovely moment. Yes, it was a rather of a surprise to see an old friend. Yes, that was lovely. Yeah. So we're going to talk about various approaches to our health, and we're going to talk about toxic relationships, which is what Save Your Sanity is all about. But I use a lot of alternative approaches for my health. And sometimes we don't recognize the connection, the body-mind connection strongly enough. We may pay lip service to it and say, oh yeah, I understand. But <clears throat> it's really a tighter connection than most people believe, isn't it? Absolutely, absolutely. And, and it's, yeah. it's important for us to really get the gravity of that, that you know, right now, of course, uh, hopefully we'll be all free of the coronavirus and stay that way. However, people are a little more interested in, in things now that they've looked at. There are things that can happen to you. And it wasn't anything that you did. It just happened. Yeah. And we'll yeah. notice that a weaker immune system makes people sometimes more susceptible. And I'm always talking to people about the relationship with things like uh, fibromyalgia, things like that that are coming up when people have chronic stress and anxiety from a toxic relationship. What do you say about that connection? I think you've just outlined a great connection. Um, currently, in my practice, we have a screening system that identifies within the first visit, within the first 45 minutes, whether one of the major components that is impacting your health is due to emotional reasons. Mm. And if it is emotional reasons, is invariably due to early childhood programming and is invariably due to toxic relationships. So this is not just something we pay lip service to, it's something that we look at every day. Yes. And although I may not talk about uh, toxic relationships per se, the way you talk <laughs> about it, um, it's something that I work on seriously every day. And when we look at childhood programming and we look at how it impacts the nervous system, the immune system, it's really about toxic relationships. And the earliest toxic relationships are with your caretakers, your primary caretakers. Yes. Oh. Yeah. And, and one thing we know for sure that if you have had a toxic relationship with a primary caregiver, you know, my term for these toxic people are hijackals. So if you had a hijackal parent, 
<clears throat> you are likely to not even know what's been put into your mind, into your underlying programming, if you like. It's yeah. almost like you had a virus put into yeah. your underlying programming yeah. and it's going to yeah. show up at some time, a yeah. little bit of malware <laughs> yes. or maybe a lot of malware. Yeah. So <clears throat> let's talk for a minute about that because it is one of those red flags that we yeah. can all be sure to say, oh, just a minute, did I experience childhood neglect? Did I experience yes. childhood trauma? Did I feel as though I were loved and welcomed with joy? Yeah. Was I an integral part and felt calm and safe in my home? Those are good questions to start with, do you think? Yeah, absolutely. And uh, it's really tricky because if you ask most people, did you have a good childhood? Invariably, they would say yes. So it's, you have to age, go around the question really, really carefully. So the next question to ask is, did you feel loved? Did you feel respected? Did you feel acknowledged in a way that you recognized as feeling loved, respected, and acknowledged? Because I think the fundamental challenge we all struggle with and it carries on into adulthood, is that although our primary caretakers may have loved us and acknowledged us and all of that, it's very often not in our terms. So exactly. This, yeah. yeah. So we have and, this huge lack. Yeah, and you use the word acknowledged, and the, a word that I would expand it with yeah. is the word validated. Yeah. Because if you have a hijackal parent, that hijackal parent only cares about you when you make them look good. So if you go to them and you, you're looking for them just to love you because you're sitting there and you're cute, yeah. they're like, I'll take you out and people will say, oh, what a cute child. And they'll yeah. be quite happy to have you there. But at home, you're an annoyance and a nuisance. You know, be seen and not heard. Get out of my way. What I am yeah. doing is more important. And these are such vital things to to look at in your background when you're at any time, whether you're experiencing some kind of physical ailment or not, but absolutely important to take note of. And so I'm so glad you brought that up right at the beginning. I mean, you're so well known in your field and what could be at a more pivotal time to have all the experience that you have. Um, it's been 20 years since you wrote your first book. And I want to talk about some of the underlying components of your work. So let me just tell everybody the important pieces that I want to bring up about who you are and why we should be really taking this seriously. And Dr. Sundadas An Anamale, <coughs> excuse me, Anamale is his last name, is an award winning entrepreneur, a best selling author, a strategic business mentor, and here's why we're talking. He's a professor of natural medicine and a natural medicine practitioner. And you know how many times I'm talking about alternative approaches to, to improve your health. And Dr. Sundardas created the Million Dollar Designed Life Formula after working with more than 15,000 individuals in 30 countries. And I hope that you will go to his website and learn more. It's drsundardas.com and that's D-R-S-U-N-D-A-R-D-A-S.com. So let's continue this conversation because I've used the term natural medicine. And, you know, sometimes when I say that, I think, why would we ever want unnatural medicine? <laughs> you know, um, does anybody else stop and say natural medicine? That makes sense. Unnatural medicine? Why would I want that? What do you think? Uh, that's an interesting way of looking at it. We distinguish natural medicine from uh, Western medicine. <laughs> <laughs> and I would use the word natural medicine to cover multiple approaches. So technically, I'm a naturopath, homeopath, acupuncturist, and I do manual medicine, and I do functional medicine. And um, behind all of that, uh, there are a combination of different branches. For example, if you look at German acupuncture, which is a very interesting branch, they combine Chinese acupuncture with homeopathy, and they use equipment to measure stuff. 
and they have different ideas of uh, functional stuff and emotional stuff and all of that. So when we are looking at hijackles and emotional well-being, I'm looking at a biochemical basis for those dysfunctions, apart from the emotional yeah. basis. So important. You know, yeah. I happen to be so interested in natural medicine from a very early age because yeah. I was, my mother was in a mental institution and I was raised for a few years by my godmother and godfather and they were vitally interested in natural things. They had a big garden and I have all her books. She was 55 when I was born, but I have her books on Kneep baths and all yeah. kinds of, of natural things that, that she encouraged me to look at, changed my life because my parents were like 100% allopath and they <clears throat> honestly believed that MD stands for medical deity you know <laughs> and i would say no no there's so much more and um, they oh there you go again with your stuff you know but i know that i was given this gift of being introduced to this as a small child i was three years old at the time so i grew up with them around me with great food every meal was a celebration of what are we having why are we having it you know it was very interesting and we get away from that we drift away from the natural to the expedient, don't we? Like grab yeah. something to eat as opposed to what will actually feed me. Yes. And uh, that's a great introduction because my father was a pharmacist and mm -hmm. I had a significant medical issue. And I was, they started doing surgery when I was six months old and mm -hmm. it continued for forever. And you know, 20 years of antibiotics and drugs. So it was basically me finding my way to an alternative. To be fair, I'm absolutely grateful for the surgical interventions because you do need surgery for yeah. congenital birth defects and all of that. Um, after that though, natural approaches would have made the whole process easier if they had been available. So as an autistic, um, right now, I work with children who come in at three and a half years old. And in one year, we do what took me 20 years to do it on my own. Wow. See, so that's a real uh, benefit. I'm still I, grateful for what happened in the early years. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, I think you bring up a good point, and I'd like to emphasize it too. I don't think it's an all or nothing approach. I think that you know you don't cut one side out in order to have the other we have so much available to us and then you have to kind of use your brain to figure out what's good for you and to sense your way through it but stay informed find out what's possible don't don't close your mind to the possibility that someone says or does something and then someone else says that's woo woo and weird. And so you close your mind to it, but it might be just the avenue that your body, mind, spirit needs. And it's an important thing to open yourself to. Now, I would imagine that people immediately heard you say that you do this wonderful thing with children on the spectrum and they're going to say how do i get to talk to him so i'm going to remind you that the uh where you'll find dr sundardas's website is exactly there dr sundardas.com d-r-s-u-n-d-a-r-d-a-s.com and there will be a whole lot of information for you there and contact and all of that. So for those people who don't know this term functional medicine, it's only been around for the last 10 years or so. So tell us what that means to you. Well, um, functional medicine may have been around in the public eye for 10 years, but it roots go back to about 25, 30 years or maybe even 40 years. And the easy way of explaining that is Western medicine is what we would call the objective study of illness. Mm -hmm. So in other words, if you are sick and you go to a medical doctor and you will run some tests and say, ah, that's it, your blood pressure is low, you have something wrong with your blood, your white blood cells, so on and so forth. So we can measure them 
and measure how sick you are. The conventional natural medicine is the subjective study of wellness. So we find out how well you are and the criteria that different people, practitioners use can vary quite a bit. So it's very subjective. If you are being managed or treated by a good natural medicine practitioner, you get great results. If the person is not so competent, then the results are somewhat debatable. Now, because they both have a totally different framework, there's often a communication gap. Enter functional medicine, which both Western doctors and natural medicine practitioners can do. That is a way of looking at your wellness in an objective way. So we can measure how well you are on an assessment device or test. And regardless of which orientation you are, you will both agree this is what it is. And then you can use appropriate interventions. So it's the objective attempt to uh, create a wellness approach. And that will be the main distinguishing factor. How you go around creating that approach can depend on your background and your training. So you mm -hmm. can use drugs sometimes, inverted commas, supplements, manual stuff, acupuncture, different energetic approaches, then a great diet, sunlight, exercise. But the key is at the end of it, we can go back and measure you and say, look, has your wellness marker improved? Mm -hmm. I really like that distinction that Western medicine is an objective study of illness and functional medicine is a subjective study of wellness. Ob objective, objective. Objective, objective study, study of wellness? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, but there are so many subjective pieces connected yes. to it that are often not considered in the Western medicine yes. model. Right. And that's an important thing. You may not yeah. think that your, your, your feelings or your underlying stress or your chronic anxiety is a direct connection to what's going on in your body. But yeah. when you take a moment to think about it, just in this conversation, you can't deny that that's possible. And you've brought up acupuncture a few times. You talked about German acupuncture. Just insert this. You know, I have underlying things that I deal with, just one in my life. And where I found great, great relief was through Japanese acupuncture, where the Japanese took traditional Chinese medicine and then they combined it with how the breath works in the body. Yeah. And so there are all these things to explore. And when I was looking at the information that you gave me, you know, we talk about something else. And that's the idea of vibrational medicine. So we've got functional medicine and natural medicine and vibrational medicine and energy medicine. All these options. Now, I hope that's exciting because I think it's really exciting that you have all those options. But we have to have an open mind in order to embrace those things. So <clears throat> what led you in that direction after you were so well helped by allopathic medicine? What, <clears throat> what incident or who opened your mind to something different? Well, uh, Western medicine rebuilt my peace. It uh, ensured that technically all the structures were intact. It didn't do anything for my allergies, uh, my dysfunctional status, my autism, uh, learning disabilities, lack of focus, etc. I could go on. Mm -hmm. There were chronic eyes, headaches, sinuses, sinus issues, a whole host of other stuff. So I could function, but in a challenged fashion. And so there had to be other alternatives. And apart from nutrition and diet, I started getting curious about the mind and emotions. And as an autistic, it was almost like looking at emotions was like, what is this? Because <laughs> I couldn't relate to standard emotions. I had a very narrow range of be safe and avoid trouble. But the rest of it was really outside my can. Mm -hmm. So it led to me, uh, exploring emotions, the way an anthropologist studies uh, a tribe. 
You know, it's interesting you said that because the image that I was getting was it was like taking up butterfly collecting, yes. you know, like <clears throat> there's something over there I don't know anything about. Let me look at it with some perspective because I don't yeah. relate to it, right? Yeah. Yeah. So I think you're bringing up a really important thing and connected everyone to uh, what <clears throat> Dr. Sundar Das said earlier, which is that he's working with children three and a half years old for a year and finding great results in the de development of their emotional and social growth in terms of their physical health, which is very, very important. And it, therefore, I mean, that's a very clear case, but think how it speaks, this functional vibrational energy medicine, natural medicine. <laughs> think how that speaks to each one of us because we're natural human beings. You know, how the sunlight affects us, how the air affects us, uh, all the things that we're taking in, processing and, and dealing with and asking the body to deal with, aside from the relational. So I want to go to the relational ones because, of course, that's a big focus here at Save Your Sanity podcast. So tell me, <clears throat> when you're in a relationship, I want your view on this because certainly I have mine. Uh, <clears throat> How do you know, from your point of view, when a relationship is not in your best interest? The easiest way of looking at it is if I'm talking to someone, if they're going to be my friend, and I engage with them, and after I've been with them for about 45 minutes, do I feel energized, sustained, or do I feel drained? Do I, and we can say all the nice things. We can have a really pleasant conversation. But what is the underlying feeling that I have? Am I pouring into their cup? Are they pouring into my cup? Or do I feel like I'm pouring into their cup and all I feel is there's nothing coming back into mine? They can say nice things. They can do pleasant things. But there is a subtext. There is an underlying energy which is I give to you, you give to me, and in giving to each other, we become more. The other one is I take, and I take, and I take, and I take. And uh, sometimes it's actual verbal stuff. It can be toxic words. At other times, you feel like your energy is just, you're pouring into a bottomless well. That would be the easiest way to tell. Well, of course, I agree with you. <laughs> That's not, not going to be a surprise. But I love the, the way that you gave someone a direct way of, of tuning into the feeling. Do I feel as though I've been energized or drained in a relationship on a regular basis? Every now and again, we're going to have yes. a needy friend. Uh, yeah. And we want to be there for them. But, sure. you know, you just also tapped into the three things, one of the three things that I believe are hallmarks of a healthy relationship of any kind. And those three things are, um, <clears throat> excuse me, equality equ or equity, reciprocity, and mutuality. And if those three things aren't there, you're going to have trouble with the relationship. It's not going to feel good. It's always going to feel lopsided. And so you're talking about there being that lack of equality and equity in the relationship. And again, it speaks to the reciprocity. Will you listen to me and I listen to you? Um, do you have my back? Will you walk by my side? You know, how do we, ha how do we have that? Not a scoreboard, not a tit for tat kind of thing, but the reciprocity that I can trust you to be in a reciprocal relationship with me and I'm safe. So very important, isn't it? Yeah. And uh, you know that when you're with somebody that you can trust, that uh, if you have a problem, you can call them and they're going to be there for you and vice versa. Mm -hmm. And I want to contrast that with somebody I've reconnected with after years. And it only took three sessions for me to realize how toxic that relationship was. And normally, um, I wouldn't allow a relationship to go beyond one session. But, you know, we haven't met for years. And the first one was fine. And by the second one, it was like, I couldn't believe it, right? It was one hour. And I felt so much toxicity spewing from this person. It was like the world's... Uh, unsafe place, 
uh, he broke up with his wife, she was a toxic person, she betrayed him, and then he went on about um, an accident that occurred with people who were bicycling, and he said, why don't you, me, do something about it? And this was his concern. And his whole thing was, I was this professor, this entrepreneur, this award-winning staff, I was a significant person, and therefore it was on me to go around adding on this extra duty yeah. when it was his area of greatest concern. <laughs> it was like this whole conversation was, you should write to this person, you should write to that person, and that was his area of interest. And here I was, I have my patients, I have my regular clients, I have my regular concerns, I'm the head of a charity body which we do all these projects, I have all the specific areas that I've lined up for two years, and I'm spending one hour of the precious time having lunch with you so that we can reconnect. <laughs> well, you know, that's great awareness, and we all need to have that kind of ability to calibrate what's going on. But yeah. many people are raised in the idea that, you know, and, and this is a phrase, Sundardas, I'd like to get out of the English language. I don't know what other languages have it, but there are two phrases I want out of the English language. One of them is, give until it hurts. Oh. Yeah, see, I mean, it, that causes your toes to curl. Yeah. It does mine too. Like, w if everybody did that, everybody would be ill and everybody yeah. would be hurting. But we get these ideas in our head that, that a good person does that, that we, you know, go and we just give <clears throat> ourselves over to somebody else across that lunch table. Oh, well, maybe I should. Maybe you're right. Oh, you need help. You know, we get all into that. And then we come away drained, as you said earlier, yeah. and we're thinking, oh, maybe I'm not a good person because now I feel yeah. drained. What was wrong with me that I didn't want to jump in and do all this yeah. philanthropic educational work? And we have to learn to calibrate that carefully, don't we? Yeah, and, and that's a great point. And so I'm going to start off by saying I don't see myself as a good person. Ah. So I'm, I, I'm off that, that, that journey. I don't see myself as a good person. My, my ego is tied up with being an effective person. Oh, nicely said. Okay? So yeah. as an effective person, I'm a very limited, I'm a very limited being. Limited energy, limited mindset, limited skill sets. And I'm working against enormous forces of entropy. So I have to be very careful with the application of my energy. I want to make sure that every person I engage with in a meaningful fashion, I can add to their lives. But we can only do that if we both have a mutually agreed upon goal that we are working towards. So the but moment... Let me just interrupt there because I can just hear mine sliding away. Um, because... You know, we want to be careful, like we can apply ourselves to something, but if, if it's not mutual, yes. we've got a problem, right? That's yes. what you're saying. Okay. Yes, absolutely. And so if it's not mutual, then I'm not going to spend my energy and time. And so as an autistic, uh, I became very conscious of this limited energy stuff. So I would always protect it as the first off. So the moment I experience somebody is unsafe and unreliable, I would automatically <clears throat> get out of there really in a hurry. It yeah. started from really young. Oh. And it's one of the best things I do now uh, because without being judgmental, without saying you, uh, I'm good and you are bad, I'm just saying we don't have a mutually agreed upon goal. But you're self-protective. That's what you're yes. talking about. Yeah. And self-protection means not that it's not selfish. It's not any of those things. It just simply says, I know where I start and you begin and vice versa. Yeah. Yeah. I know how much energy I have to use right now. I know yeah. how to portion that out. And yeah. it's a wise thing to do because when we don't have that well in place, when we don't have boundaries, when we don't understand those things, we will get hooked into that idea that a good person does more. A good person goes the extra mile. And yes, when you have the energy to do that, and sometimes life intervenes, you don't have the energy, but you yeah. want to do it anyway. But on a day-to-day -day basis, health is involved. Yeah. Health in all aspects, saying that 
I don't have this to give right now. You yes. know, one of the things I'm known for saying all the time is you can't give a gift you don't have. Yes. If I want to give you this, I can't give it to you unless I'm holding it. Well, if I don't have self-care and I'm not taking care of myself, I don't have enough energy to take care of you. <clears throat> and we have to learn to be clear about that, that if I, if I want to give love, I have to have love within me. I have to generate it to give. Yeah. And those things are very important for us to really think through and take the time to think through, to find ourselves important enough to take the time to think through. So many things. So what do you think the cost of a toxic relationship is? Uh, let me put this in perspective. Every one of my patients with chronic illnesses has got a toxic relationship in the background. If you have chronic autoimmune issues, you have a toxic relationship in the background. You come in with an emotional breakdown, you have a toxic relationship in the background. And the hardest part of the whole approach is not the diagnosis, it's not the treatments, it's getting them to realize the major impact <clears throat> of the toxic relationships in their background that has led to the current situation. Well said. You know, I'm not a medical doctor. My doctorate's in psychology. But from my point of view, it matches completely your point of view. I have so many people who have fibromyalgia or uh, ankylosing spondylitis or things like that that are occurring to them and they think it is so separate from their emotional yeah. life or from their background and going back to that analogy of it being malware that's installed in our early life we don't know we didn't put the disc in and install yeah. it <laughs> we have to go back in and find out where it came from and and just say I don't want this anymore. I want something different. We don't have to get into blame and shame and all yeah. about our past. We can yeah. just simply say, oh, there it is. I don't like that piece of malware. Yeah. I'm going to take it out and replace it with something healthier. Yeah. Let's be in the moment now moving forward. But yeah. do go and find where it came from. So yeah. very important. So I teach a program I've been doing for 25 years. And I just did that yesterday where we take people back to the early childhood patterns and we have a process where you take them back to the time when they got this piece of negative programming from one of their significant parent, a parental figures, mm -hmm. and we teach them how to change it. And after we've done that, what I call piece of emotional surgery, we give them a daily um, practice, which is to monitor the emotions and become aware of when something triggers them. So they are developing this uh, emotional hygiene, mm -hmm. boundary containment. What is it that sets you off? And what's, why is it setting you off? And who is setting you off? So you're beginning to develop a heightened awareness of your emotional terrain rather than being totally oblivious of it. So wise. So wise. I mean, first of all, you're empowering people to do something about it themselves. And secondarily, you're telling them this will work for any piece that you have in your past. That's yeah. such good information. <clears throat> so for those of us who need more from you, remember you can go to drsundardas.com, D-R-S-U-N-D-A-R-D-A-S.com. So much, and, and uh, Dr. Sundadas has a gift for you. It is a what he calls the Cliff's Note version of his book, Life by Design. Don't worry about it, it's in the show notes. You can click on the link there and go directly to that and get it. And that will get you in touch with Dr. Sundadas as well, because when you sign up to get that free ebook, you will be in touch with him. So you're doing fabulous work in the world. And you know what I really love about it is your story, that it's not something that's over there. You've lived it. You've walked it. You continue to journey through it. It's a day-by-day -day experience for you. So thank you so much for all that you're doing. 
Thank you so much for allowing me to share these ideas with you and your tribe. So good. My guest today, Dr. Sundada Sanamale, you want to learn way more about him. I hope he'll come back and talk with us again in six months or so and see where the world is at that time. In the meantime, take very good care of yourself. And you know, I say that at the end of each broadcast, and you know why I say that at the end of each broadcast? Because you are precious. You are precious, and I hope that you will t treat yourself as precious and know that you matter. Take care. Talk soon. Thank you for joining me on the Save Your Sanity podcast today. I hope you've had some new insights, some ideas and strategies to help you gain clarity and confidence for moving forward toward greater emotional health and safety. You deserve that, and so do your children. If you found value here and would like to support this podcast with a dollar or five each month, please do so at patreon.com slash save your sanity. Learn more about how to work with me via video conference, join my optimized circles, or subscribe to this podcast on my YouTube channel at my website.